Okay, so uh, welcome to the 7th uh, Johannesburg School on string theory, uh, which uh, is made possible by generous funding from uh, Mithil, uh, um, uh, and which uh, will consist of several uh, series of lectures on relatively recent uh, and perhaps less recent um, topics uh, within um, sort of uh, that are related somehow to string theory. Um, and the, the lectures I want to, to, to give are about, um, well, how to from statistical models to CFT. So uh, I'm not assuming that all of you have good familiarity with uh, CFT, which means for formal field theory. And this, in three hours, of course, it's not really possible to uh, go through uh, all the details, but I hope I can at least give you an indication of uh, how. Um, we can start from statistical mechanical models and at the vicinity of what we call critical points uh, describe them by a conformal field theory. Uh, so that's um, the, main, uh, the main goal of these uh, lectures, just to convince you that you can take something that looks perhaps quite familiar to you, like a model, a spin model for some ferromagnetic material, and uh, from there uh, go to something which perhaps looks a little bit more abstract, uh, which is the formalism and theory of or form of the theory. Okay, so the, the main uh, statement that I want to convince you of in this uh, series of lectures uh, is that uh, statistical mechanical models comes out in many realistic situations, so we better know how to describe theories that have this conformal symmetry. Uh, so the plan of these talks is that today uh, I'm going to discuss uh, the theory around what is known as critical exponents uh, and phase transitions. So I'll just, this is going to be material that is uh, standard from statistical mechanics. Uh, so I'm going to kind of, you know, uh, use a kind of a broad brush. Uh, but hopefully I'll just, for those of you who have seen it before, uh, remind you uh, what the main concepts are uh, related to the theory of uh, critical phenomena. So what the critical exponents in particular, uh, and um, then um, uh, use that as a basis for the following uh, lectures. Then, uh, in the next lecture, uh, I, I plan to discuss conformal invariants. Uh, and uh, two-dimensional CFD. Uh, which is the, the CFD part of the, of the title. And then, in the last lecture, okay, uh, assuming that things go uh, as planned with respect to time, uh, the idea is to add these two things together and uh, sort of relate uh, uh, 
uh, relate uh, critical exponents uh, to CFTs, to specific CFTs. And much of this is going to go through uh, a specific example, uh, which will kind of, uh, some of you are probably familiar with, but I'm going to also spend some time uh, uh, explaining, which is the Heisen model. Okay. It is one of the simplest statistical mechanical models that kind of is a very rough approximation to a ferromagnet, as we're going to see. And uh, it, uh, it also has a very nice and interesting conformal feature interpretation. So somehow we're going to put these, uh, all, we'll try to put all these things uh, together um, into somehow and, and motivate why uh, a particular CFT describes the continuum limit of this statistical mechanical model. Um, any questions? Of course, I haven't defined anything yet, so uh, if you're not sure of critical exponents, are, it's, it's coming. Okay. So, the, um, uh, the theory, the overall theory that we're discussing is that of critical phenomena. And that is uh, defined as the study of uh, systems in particular thermodynamical systems, although it could, uh, it could go beyond that, but thermodynamical systems uh, the thermodynamics of a system um, near the critical temperature, which I'm going to call Tc for T critical, uh, of a continuous phase transition. So let me start by reminding you a few uh, concepts about phase transition um, and uh, what uh, what they have to uh, uh, what they have to and what is a continuous phase transition in particular. But let me start with something that we're all familiar with, which is uh, phase transitions in water. Okay. So if, um, so let me just draw a plot of temperature versus pressure, P is pressure, for water. Now, we, we know that if we take um, the temperature to be, this is in Kelvin, so suppose we take the temperature to be 273 Kelvin, right? Uh, what, what happens with water? Well, there is some transition there. So, so we, we all know that there's a phase transition in water, right? Uh, at 273 Kelvin, approximately. Uh, what state does it, does it transition? From ice to liquid, right? So there is a solid liquid phase transition, right? Because 273 is 100 uh, centigrade. So at, at that temperature, of course, water below that temperature we expect to be ice, and above that temperature we expect to be liquid. Now, of course, it's not that simple uh, because there's also this variable of, pre of pressure uh, that plays a significant role. So actually, the, the way that the phase diagram looks around here is there is uh, something called a triple point. And okay, maybe I'll just draw this a bit more sharp. So it goes like this. There's a triple point in water at around this temperature for which all three phases, what's the other possible phase you can have? Solid, liquid, and? Yeah, gas, vapor. So all these phases can coexist at a particular point. Now, obviously, this is not something we observe in in, in our everyday life because for this to happen, the temperature, uh, sorry, the pressure has to be something like 0.006, and this is an atmosphere. Okay, so it's a very low pressure. But at that very low pressure, you can actually have coexistence of three phases, and that's the triple point of water, and that is actually what is used to define. Uh, the, uh, the zero of, of, of centigrade, so what is actually uh, zero Celsius. Okay. It's defined based on that, this triple point of, uh, of water. Now, the transition that uh, most of us think of, of course, is not this one, 
uh, it's kind of up here, let's take this to be now one atmosphere. And that is between, so if you, if you draw this line, here we have ice, and here we have liquid. And here we have um, gas on the other side of this transition. So, so this is the transition that we were discussing. Okay? Uh, that it goes at one atmosphere, water goes from ice to liquid, and then, of course, there's another transition at one atmosphere, which is here, right, at 373, where there's a phase transition again between uh, liquid and gas. Okay. So this is, uh, this is what is familiar with, uh, we're all familiar with. The problem about this, this is actually, despite sort of the time I'm spending on this, is precisely what we're not going to discuss. Uh, because this is, this transition is here, when you cross this, uh, by the way, this is also 273, I mean, this is very vertical, so this is actually quite close. It's not exactly the same, but it's quite close. But these transitions are first order phase transitions. And the definition of a first order phase transition is that, uh, well, technically it has to do, as we're going to discuss a bit later, we'll use the concept of the free energy. And there's a discontinuity in the first derivatives of the free energy. In particular, one of the first derivatives of the free energy uh, is the density of the uh, Gibbs density of your uh, of your system. And I think you can agree with me that uh, on either side of these two, uh, suppose you go from liquid to gas, on either side, the density is very different, right? And the density of water and the density of water vapor is very different. So the density jumps as you cross this line. Okay. So this is called a first order phase transition because, uh, because of this. There's this discontinuity um, in the say, first derivative of the free energy. There's a, there's a better way of stating it. A more modern way has to do with latent heat, but okay, I won't need all these details in, uh, in my example. Uh, but uh, these are not the continuous phase transitions that are related to critical phenomena. Okay. Now, but you can find such a point though, you can find such a transition in water. If we keep on going, suppose we extend this and we increase the pressure and we increase the temperature, we will still have a well-defined uh, phase transition, first order phase transition between liquid and, um, and gas, until we reach a point, okay, which has been known for quite some time, uh, which is at 647 degrees. And at a pressure of 218 atmospheres. Okay, so this is, you have quite some high pressure here and quite some high temperature. It turns out that at this point, uh, which is known as the critical point of water, this line stops. So I had drawn this line of the phase transition, but this line simply stops. There's nothing here afterwards. Which means that here, actually, if you're prepared to go through this point, uh, these phases coexist. So the distinction between vapor and liquid is immaterial. And these points, these critical points, are more what we're going to talk about. So the claim is that at these critical points, there, is, there, there might be a, a, a description of the system with a conformal field. Now, of course, uh, okay, this, uh, this is a bit hard to observe in, in practice, this critical point, but you can, you can take other kinds of materials, other liquids uh, or, uh, or gases, and, uh, which have critical points at sort of lower pressures and lower temperatures, and it's actually something you can observe when you make eye when this happens. When you take uh, a material which is transparent, like water, and uh, you bring it to its critical point, what you see is cloudiness. So suddenly it becomes milky. And that is a very important part of what we're going to discuss. Why does it do that? Um, it's called critical opalescence, uh, as a sort of technical statement. Why does it do that? Well, the, the reason is that the normal fluctuations in the material, which scatter light, suddenly, when you reach this critical point, they start becoming, instead of being microscopic, they start becoming macroscopic, and they start uh, uh, diffracting light in a, in a very different way. 
So instead of light, so it, it stops the material from being transparent and it makes it cloudy just because there are fluctuations happening in the material uh, which uh, are of such a wavelength that they actually uh, interfere with, um, with visible light and the material appears opaque. So something is happening here. Some kind of uh, fluctuations which used to be, you know, atomic scale, okay, and then, you know, they would interact with X-rays perhaps because that's the scale of atomic physics. Uh, then suddenly they become big enough to interact with visible light, okay? Uh, and that means that correlations, so the, cor the correlation between different parts of the material has become big. And this is the concept we want to extract from this diagram, okay, and from this story of, um, of phase transition. But this was one example of water. But let me give you another example, which is also going to be very, very actually even more relevant uh, to, uh, to what we're doing. Okay, any questions so far? So what, what I want you to get out of that uh, this example is that there's something funny happening at the critical point, okay? and which we're going to try to model and understand. Okay, so another example that we can uh, discuss is basically just iron. Now you know that iron uh, is a magnetic material. Okay, it, it exhibits what we know as magnetization. So if you take uh, iron and you you introduce if you put it in a magnetic field, and then you slowly take the magnetic field to zero, well, the iron stays back and dies, right? Uh, so so you, get, uh, you get some residual uh, magnetization, we're going to have a lot to say about it, and we can plot. Um, if I plot here the external magnetic field, and here I plot uh, the, the temperature, so this process happens uh, at, at any temperature, when I start with, uh, so, so let me take the accelerated field to be zero, so I'm on, on this line here. Okay, so this is after I've done the process of, you know, sort of introducing the field and I'm taking it uh, to be zero. Then there is a point, though, which is known as TC, and C in this case starts for Curie. So Pierre Curie was the first uh, to, uh, uh, to characterize this and study it. Uh, so this is called the Curie temperature. Uh, which is 1,044 kelvins. So this is measured in kelvin, so it's 1,044. Where this thing doesn't happen anymore. So if I take iron above this critical temperature and I magnetize the magnetic condition to zero, then at zero external field, the magnetization of iron is going to be zero. So, that, so something funny is happening there. Okay, so let me also plot it in a different way. Of course, I haven't defined the magnetization yet, but I will. Uh, so, but you can imagine what it is, right? I mean, you can measure how magnetic your, your sample is, but in some direction. And let me plot this as a function of temperature. And actually, let me plot the magnetization at a given temperature over the magnetization at zero. Zero temperature. I mean, so suppose you take your iron to absolute zero, and it, it will have some magnetization. So, uh, which basically means if you, if you pick it up, I mean, it's, it, it's a magnet, right? It has some magnetic storage. And then, now let's let's take here this TC. What is happening is okay. This starts from one, of course, because that's that's at zero, and then the magnetization goes down and hits this axis at the root. And after that, it's zero. Okay. So you see, there is a phase transition, right? So as I go along this, uh, uh, this or well, that line, let's say here, where this is uh, again the magnetic field, something is happening here. There is magnetization here. There isn't. And the same here. I mean, uh, as I as I increase the temperature, this is still the same temperature. As I increase the temperature, below this temperature, I find that my iron sample has magnetization, and above this temperature, it doesn't have magnetization. Okay, and the, the question is, you know, how do you model this? Okay? How do you understand these kinds of transitions? This is also a critical point of this kind of similar type uh, to the critical point of water that we discussed. So it's a continuous phase transition. Nothing is discontinuous. 
Okay, so in particular, you know, uh, as uh, as we said, you know, you can see that this magnetization, for instance, is not discontinuous. Uh, it's continuous, but of course, some derivatives of it are going to be discontinuous. So that's why these are called second order or higher order phase So uh, I'm using the word. The modern word is, or the modern language is to avoid using the word second order, third order phase transitions. Just call them all continuous phase transitions. Okay, so you have first order and continuous. Okay, but sometimes I'm going to slip and just call them second order. Uh, because that's what it has been called for many years. Uh, so, this, uh, uh, okay, so this is the behavior of iron. And the question is, um, let's zoom in into this area. Because we want to be close to the critical point. Because we want to understand the physics here of this sample. Okay, close to the critical point. Now, how does the, uh, the localization behave? Well, it's easy to see that, okay, this, since it goes to, uh, to zero, it's going to go like something like Tc minus T. Okay. Uh, since it goes to zero at uh, Tc, uh, to some power. Okay, and the question is, what is this power? We can do it experimentally. So experimentally, we can take R and we can... Uh, you know, uh, look at its magnetization. These are not very easy problems, of course, because we're talking about magnetization very close to zero, so there's a lot of noise, because we we'll look at this area, so the magnetization is small. Uh, but you can do this experiment, and you can find the magnetization, um, how this behaves, and, and you find experimentally that the exponent is roughly 0 0.34. So even though this looks perhaps like a square root, okay, it's, it's not a square root, so it's not like a half, it's more like a third. Although I draw it a little bit like a square root. Okay, here. And this is very important, okay, this distinction. Like, uh, and what is this actual, um, yeah, what is this number? Now, of course, we would not be interested in these numbers so much if they were totally different for different materials. So if you look at, uh, you know, if you take nickel and do the same thing, or use some other material, which is magnetic, uh, and I find totally different numbers here, then I will say, okay, you know, this is uh, some uh, random property of this material, which, you know, is interesting perhaps for material science, but is perhaps also interesting uh, from a theoretical perspective. But in, um, what turns out to be the case is that over a wide range of materials, these exponents if you do exactly the same thing, you're going to find beta to be roughly 0 0.34. Okay, with, with small fluctuations. So these exponents are what we call universal. They're not universal across everything, it's not every single material is going to happen, but there are broad classes of these materials, often called universality classes, uh, which exhibit similar behavior. Okay, and that means that actually the theory near the critical point, even though you know this is a complex material, uh, you know perhaps there might be also defects and other things in the material, but close to the critical point, we expect the physics to be simple, because a wide range of systems have basically the same physics. So there must be some you know simple description of it that gives us these numbers. So the theory of critical exponents is partly the theory of understanding these numbers. I'm going to make a list of these numbers uh, soon. Uh, because there's quite a big bunch of these critical exponents, uh, and understanding them and seeing what, uh, how can we uh, calculate them for a given one. Calculate them theoretically instead of verify them experimentally or simulating them on a computer, which is also possible. Okay. Um, any questions so far? What are we trying to do? Okay, good. So, Let's now okay, move away from the this was introduction, okay, just to set the stage. Let's now start doing some statistical mechanics. And I'll be working in the, uh, as you know, in statistical mechanics, there are basically three different ensembles you can work with. There's the macro-canonical, canonical, and grand-canonical. Uh, I'll be working in the situation where we have a system uh, like a ferromagnet. Uh, I'm going to say more, or if, but think of, for instance, a, a lattice of spins, this is the most basic example you can think of, so you have some lattice, and at each lattice set you have a spin, and it's the properties of these spins that decide if the system has magnetization or doesn't have magnetization. 
right? So if the strings are aligned, for instance, then you expect magnetization. If they are, you know, completely randomized, then the magnetization is you. Okay, so these are the kinds of systems we're thinking of. And the, we're thinking of these, not that constant energy, but that constant temperature. Okay, because we're thinking of this as embedded in some, you know, uh, as being in contact with this environment, which is at some given temperature, and we can change its temperature in order to tune it uh, to the phase transition. So the appropriate ensemble for this is the canonical ensemble. Okay. Where the temperature and not the energy is uh, is constant. So, if now we call uh, C a given configuration, in our system, what is a configuration? It's a particular uh, set that tells me, you know, which uh, spin 1 is up, spin down, uh, spin 2 is up, spin 3 is down. So this is called a configuration. I can, I can imagine many different configurations where, say, spin 3 is up, but then spin 4 is down, or you know, whatever. So there's a large amount, but not infinite, of different configurations of the system. Uh, the main uh, ingredient in uh, dealing with the canonical ensemble uh, is, uh, first of all, Boltzmann's formula, which gives us the probability of a given configuration to arise. So if I, if I give you some specific configuration, say, where the first 100 spins are pointing up and the, the second 50 spins are pointing down and so on, I give you a particular configuration, then I, I can ask you how probable is that configuration. Okay? I'm on, uh, so if I were to just uh, figure out what is the, the microstate of my system, what is in my ensemble, what is the particular uh, configuration that I, I want, how probable is it that I'm going to find this particular one? And that is given by the formula 1 over z, uh, hopefully repeating things that we're familiar with, over where Z is going to be our main uh, object in, this, uh, in these lectures, it's what is known as the partition function. And where I'm using the standard notation beta which is 1 over the Boltzmann constant times the temperature. I'm putting a little t here just to distinguish it from this beta. These two things have absolutely nothing to do with each other. This is a critical exponent. It's a dimensionless uh, number. Uh, this is uh, just uh, another way of expressing the temperature. In these kind of Boltzmann weights uh, notation. Okay, so what does this formula tell us? It tells us that, well, basically, the higher your energy, so suppose I have a configuration on a finite energy, the higher the energy is, uh, up to some sort of caveats which we're going to discuss, the lower the probability of that given configuration. Right? Because the energy increases, as energy increases, exponential becomes smaller. So basically, this tells us that the system really wants to get its ground state. It wants to, in the most configurations in the system, are going to be very close to the ground state, which is the state with the lowest amount of energy. And now when, when that, uh, so when we take the statistical average, now what is the statistical average? I'm going to just write the formula in the next, um, uh, just in the next blackboard. It's, it's the way we describe, describe the systems. So instead of taking the same system and uh, doing the same measurement many times, to figure, to figure out what is the average value of a given quantity, well, we can theoretically think of having, you know, uh, an infinity or near infinity of ensembles, uh, which all, you know, realize different configurations, and then the statistical average is just average over all these possible configurations. Uh, and it turns out that this, that this average, of course, is going to be mostly, uh, mostly given by the most probable configurations. So, if you want to ask for the probable value of the energy, for instance, at a given temperature, well, you know, that's, uh, it's more likely you're going to find the ground state and that the average energy is going to be closer to the energy of the ground state than of some very highly excited state. 
up to some caveats, of course, which we're going to discuss, which involve entropy. Uh, so let me let me just put this in the formula as I just said. Uh, the expectation value of some observable, which I'm going to call no, is given by one over z, sum over configurations. The value of this observable for a given configuration times uh, e to the minus v delta t, the energy of that configuration. And of course, we, uh, it, it's, it's always the case that we divide by the partition function in order to keep things properly normalized. Okay, so, we, uh, so the, the partition function is always sort of part of the, uh, the normalization of our observable. Okay, uh, so let's uh, start by rewriting the partition function just a little bit uh, in order to introduce another uh, useful concept. And again, uh, hopefully, if you, if you feel you've heard this before, okay, uh, that's great, because okay, I'm just saying things from basic uh, statistical mechanics. And actually, maybe I should mention that much of what I'm going to say uh, follows either the standard book on statistical mechanics by Kirsten Kahn, uh, but there's also another more recent book on statistical field theory by Fusardo. Which I thank Yannick uh, for lending me his uh, copy. Um, that uh, that I'm also following to uh, to a large extent. Okay, not not yet, but uh, okay. so so if you want to brush up on statistical mechanics, um, I find version one quite a nice and readable textbook. Okay, so uh, let's write the partition function in a slightly different way. So the partition function for a system with n uh, spins that don't have to be in a line. I mean, in general here, um, and at the given temperature is, of course, uh, again, the sum over all configurations of uh, this exponential, this positive factor. Now, we can rewrite this in a, in a slightly different way by realizing that the sum over all configurations can split it according to how many configurations are there with a given energy. So suppose you know there's uh, there's, uh, there's ten configurations of you know energy one, fifteen configurations of energy two. You can split the sum uh, so that you can uh, not sum over configurations but sum over energy instead. So the way to do this would be to write sum over energies omega of e. Uh, I call you know it's the basically the number of configurations at a given energy. E to the minus theta. And now let's take this and exponentiate this factor. So I'll take this omega, which is the number of configurations in given energy, and I'm going to put it up in the exponential. So I'm still setting over energy, but now I have E to the minus theta plus the logarithm of the number of configurations of the energy. And I can finally write this. OK, so what does this remind you of? What is the logarithm of the number of configurations? The entropy. OK, that's the famous Boltzmann formula uh, for the entropy, which is the Boltzmann constant, times the logarithm of So that's what in statistical mechanics we call the entropy of a system, right? So the, the more different configurations you have in your system, the higher the entropy. So we can uh, write this now as sum e uh, e to the beta t s minus e. Okay, so uh, what I just uh, okay, so beta here is of course beta t, right? Not not the critical exponent. The ball from that. Uh, I, I just uh, multiply that divided by by temperature, uh, that's, and then there's a KE uh, in the definition of the entry. That's how I got this from. And so temperature is what because because I just took a factor of B in front, and then and it, okay. So this thing 
uh, has a name, so this sum that we did in this way uh, is equal to e minus beta t times something which we call f at the given number of particles and uh, temperature, which is the free energy. In other words, the free energy is proportional to the <coughs> logarithm of the partition function. So any statement we make about the partition function, we can also make about the free energy. Right? So that is also part of the definition of the sort of canonical example that we will deal with the free energy of the system. And uh, you can see that the free energy, maybe let me write it, write it down also a little bit further. F equals U minus Ts is a problem you might have seen. Uh, uh, then this actually tells us something very important, which is that the thermodynamic state of a system is given actually by a balance between two different things. So U is the energy, while S is the entropy. And what you want to do is you want to lower not the energy, but the free energy. Which means that uh, you can, you can, you know, it, it, there's no point in lowering your energy if that increases your entropy. Okay, that, uh, and we're going to see examples like, uh, and this allows us to make, for instance, one-line proofs of which systems are expected to have phase transitions and which not, just based on this uh, balance between um, uh, minimizing the energy, that of course we always want to do, but maximizing the entropy, which we also want to do. Uh, so, the way systems uh, behave depends on how they resolve this, um, this paradox, or you know, this, this tension between the, the energy and the energy.
So if, if uh, it's a parameter whose uh, value uh, tells you if you're in the order or, or disordered phase. Okay, that's what we call it. So the, this brings an interesting um, discussion because you see that uh, let, let's let's write actually the I think it's time to actually write down the Hamiltonian because okay we are in the end going to be doing statistical mechanics so let's write the Hamiltonian for a system uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this particular system because we're going to go to the IC model soon but just to give an idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, B. Okay. Good. So, so this is my uh, system, which uh, you know, if these are uh, in the, if these are normal spins, which are rotating in the shell frame, this is the Heisenberg model. It's known as the Heisenberg model, uh, and this notation here uh, basically is tells us some over uh, different combinations of these spins. And in all the cases we're going to look at, th this will actually mean some over nearest neighbors. So if we have, if this for instance is in a lattice, there is one spin on each lattice point, and when we calculate the Hamiltonian, which of course we need to do to get the energy of the system and all that, uh, for a given configuration, we need to, to uh, add a term like this for every nearest neighbor. So between this and this, there's going to be one term, between this and this, another term, this and this, another term, and so on. Okay. And we're going to say more about uh, particular lattices later. But the point about this is that actually uh, this has a symmetry. And actually, even, even this, at, at this simple level, you can see that there's a symmetry. Here, I'm only going to think of the spins being up or down. Here, they don't have to be only up or down. They can be any vector. Right? So they can be rotated anywhere. Uh, but if I were to ask about the energy of the system, uh, I think you would agree that the energy of, if there's no external fields, the energy of this state and the energy of this state are the same. And this Hamiltonian will agree with that statement. Suppose you put B is the external field, suppose I put that to zero, then the overall sign of the spins is immaterial, right? Because basically this is square. Right? So if I take this to minus itself and this to minus itself, I get the same answer. Right? So the, there is no difference in the energy between these two states. Um, however, the ground state of the system, what the system decides to do, is not this uh, and that, it's actually this or that. So it has to decide at some point if it wants to be in this state or in that state. And how do you achieve that in practice? Well, you have to turn on some D, and depending on the, if your field is uh, positive or negative, your external magnetic field, and then you take it to zero, well, you're going to end up with either this or that. But that means that even when B is zero, that symmetry of the Hamiltonian is actually broken. I mean, uh, even though uh, in principle, there's a symmetry that relates these two things. The, the fact that here you have magnetization, because this, this is the point of the magnetization, so there is a, a magnetization which let me roughly define it as the expectation value of the spins, say for the Z. So this is my expectation value of the spins. If this is non zero, then the symmetry. In this case, there was what we call a Z2 symmetry. If, if we're only talking about up and down, this would have an SO3 symmetry, for those who are familiar with the, uh, uh, the Hasbro model. But the fact that we actually pick a particular value of the localization uh, means that that symmetry is broken. So we have something known as spontaneous symmetry. I'm not going to have much use for it, but uh, it's, uh, it's always good to remember that um, the, the transition between ordered and disordered phases can also be thought of, not always, but, but uh, in many cases, 
as a transition between a potentially broken phase and an unbroken phase. So the unbroken phase in this case would be the high temperature case where M would be zero. So you don't have to actually the expectation would be zero, and there you, you don't have I mean this, uh, you don't have this choice imposed on you that you have to be either pointing up or pointing down because the monetization overall is zero. So there's also a transition between um, a broken and an unbroken phase. This is just, I'm just saying for those of you who are familiar with QFT, although that's something we discuss a lot, so just maybe uh, but I'm not going to have much use for it in, um, uh, in, in these lectures. So let me just say one more thing about the organization. I defined it already here, so let me just try it again. Uh, but this time let's also add the magnetic field, the external magnetic field B. And let's, for simplicity, assume that I'm putting a magnetic field not in a general direction, but only uh, among the z-axis. Okay, this is some Okay, so I'm, I'm making a magnetic field to be pointing either up or down. Okay. Um, now let's um, let's write this. This, of course, now this is what we mean by the magnetization. Uh, as uh, its expectation value of the spins. And now, if our system is translational invariant, which we assume it to be, so there's some translational invariance, because okay, often when we think about this, we think of a crystal, uh, and you know, the, the, the size of the crystal, the macroscopic dimension of the crystal, is way higher than any of the scales that are relevant to this. So we might as well assume that there is translational invariance. So if I take a block of, of spins, which are atomic distance scales apart, I mean, the, the, the certainty looks the same if I translate by you know, some number of atomic uh, uh, atomic distances apart. Because even if it's a centimeter big, I mean, we're talking about huge differences in scales. So you can assume the relation of the variance in these systems, uh, usually. And uh, in that case, this expectation, expectation value does not depend on the size. It's the same everywhere. Again, because of the assumption of the relation of variance. It doesn't matter which size. But then let's write this in terms of the partition function. Uh, this is, of course, by the definition of up there, of, of, of my expectation volume, because that's the expectation volume there, it's a sum uh, over si uh, z of e to the minus beta. Uh, I, can, I, can, I can use the Hamiltonian, it's the same thing, but the Hamiltonian. But that I'm using just the same definition on this unit. Okay, so th this is our definition. But we also have defined in the previous uh, blackboard the, the free energy. Okay? So the free energy here uh, was defined by um, by being the logarithm of the partition function. Okay, so basically it's this uh, it's the logarithm of this quantity there. So the question is, how do I get this from the free energy? And the answer is, well, let's write this down as 1 over z, sum as z, e to the minus beta. Now there's the sum over, uh, okay, I'm forgive me some stuff. Okay, so this is minus j over 2, sum as s, here, uh, minus b z. This is a beta, bz sum over the spin. Okay. Now, how do I get, so, so this is my exponent, how do I get uh, from the partition function, which is somewhat related to the free energy, how do I get this spin to be down here? Now, the partition function is exactly the same without the SZ. Because the partition function is the sum over exponentials of minus beta times the Hamiltonian. So how can I get this SZ down here? You take a derivative with respect to? Two. Not, not to S. To B. Right? So I can write this as 1 over Z, B over PB of basically Z. Uh, yeah, uh, this should be a from the. Yeah, so maybe we'll. Yeah. 
Uh, I'm being a little bit vague, okay, sure. Uh, there should be a mind issue, but yeah. And now, if you use the definition of the free energy, which uh, I'm going to skip because I think I only have eight minutes, uh, but this you can write as minus dF. So remember, the free energy was basically the logarithm of the partition function. So that you can see now, if I take the logarithm here, f of the partition function, and I take the derivative, I'm going to get this one over z. Turn right, that's the derivative of z. So that's, that's what I'm skipping a little bit, but you can figure it out. And if not, we have to tutorial. Um, so that's where the free energy is useful. You could then derive a property like the magnetization, which is an expectation value of, uh, of the spins. Uh, by getting derivatives of the free energy. So now is the time to give you some more details um, about these critical exponents. And we first say there's also something we call, which is very important, which we call the spontaneous moment. depending on the temperature, which is the limit as p goes to zero of this magnetization which is that important. Okay. So this is uh, again very important as a, um, uh, this, is the, this is what we actually were discussing here when I was discussing spontaneous integration. It's what happens when we take the magnetization for a given external field and then take the external field to zero and see what remains. Does it go to zero? Or does it stay non zero? And as we said, that depends on the level. Um, so let me now give you a list of some critical exponents. Because, okay, the representation is not the only property of the material, uh, there's, uh, there's quite a few other things we can uh, discuss. Uh, but uh, I won't have the uh, the time to go through all of them, but let me just write down the list because it's actually, you know, uh, I think it's nice, even though uh, they might not make too much sense as a, uh, uh, just as a list, but still. Uh, there's something called the heat capacity of the system, which is called uh, the C, and that also tends to have some funny property uh, near a phase transition. Basically, it goes like this. Um, and with some critical exponent which is called alpha. And this is at dB equals zero. Uh, there is uh, an exponent that we've been calling uh, beta, which has to do with the order parameter or the magnetization, which we wrote as this. Uh, and this is again at t less than pc, and the, the, for this to be positive. And as we said, the magnetization is zero after. For t larger than dc, so there's no point in writing formula like this. And then uh, again, the external field is here. Now, this beta is, the, is not the Boltzmann thing, it's the, it's the critical exponent. There's another one which is called gamma, which has to do with the, with the magnetic susceptibility of the system, uh, which goes like uh, t minus dc minus gamma, and again, that's at the external field is here. Uh, there's another one called um, delta, which has to do with how the magnetic field uh, depends on the magnetization uh, at the critical temperature. There's another one called uh, nu, which is going to be quite important in what we will discuss, uh, which has to do with a very, very important quantity called the correlation length. And this correlation length uh, goes like uh, t minus pc to some power nu. Again, p equals zero. I will spend most, much more time on correlation length. I'm just uh, uh, giving you these, uh, these numbers now, just uh, or this exponent. And then finally, another very relevant exponent is called eta. Uh, which has to do with the behavior of what is known as the connected 
two-point function of the system, um, which goes like r to the minus v minus 2 plus eta. So these are just the definitions, but of course you can, in many systems, you can actually measure all of these things. Like, as, as we said, measure the magnetization, measure the correlation length, which uh, I'm going to discuss, or this, uh, uh, this, this correlation there. Um, and you can get numbers for these. So let me write them back alpha, beta, gamma, delta, mu, beta. These are pretty standard, by the way, in this um, uh, presentation. So experimentally, over a range of systems, okay, of different systems, what are the values of these things take? So experimentally, this goes between 0 to 0 0.14. Uh, this is around 0 0.32 to 0 0.39. Remember, for iron, we set to 0 0.34. So it falls within this range, so it's the same thing as for, for iron. Um, this is 1.3 to 1.4, delta goes between 4 and 5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.05. This is how these exponents are measured uh, to be. Okay. So if, if I measure the heat capacity for a given system, <coughs> close to a critical point, I expect the exponents to be roughly in this range, between 0 and 0. And similar for the other ones, which of course I have not defined. I mean, apart from beta, I haven't really defined the other ones, but I will. Now, a technique which we're going to discuss uh, next time, or perhaps in the tutorial tomorrow, is mean field theory, which is a very powerful technique uh, because it allows us to get sort of answers to problems with a minimum amount of effort, which of course are not actually correct, but they give uh, a good feeling of the physics. A minimum theory gives these kind of numbers for these exponents. You can see that they are not uh, in very great agreement. I mean, they're in the ballpark, okay, but still, it gives a half. This is 0 0.3 something. So, you know, we're, we're close, but you know, you can see that, as you're going to see, with a minimum amount of physical input, you can get numbers that are not too far off from, from these things. Right? And again, this is experimental data for a, a very wide range of systems, like liquids and ferromagnets, antiferromagnets, and so on, which all have some critical points. So that's why there's variation here, because it depends on the system. The system we are going to discuss is the 2D uh, Ising model. And the beauty of this model, and the reason that it plays such an important role in theoretical physics, is that it's one of the very few non-trivial statistical models, non-trivial in the sense that it exhibits phase transition, which has been solved exactly. It was solved in 1944 by one side. We're not going to go through the solution, although we're going to say much more about the system. And so we know this exponents precisely for the system. And they go like this, 0, 1, 8, 7, 4, 15, 1, and 1 more. And you might complain a little bit looking at these parameters because you're like, well, you know, I mean, I mean, how, if, if this is an exact solved system, then why doesn't really match any of the experimental numbers? Well, the main reason, as far as I know, uh, is that these numbers are also very dimensionally dependent. I mean, they depend a lot on the dimension of the system you're looking at. And effectively, are the systems that are looked at here are three-dimensional. So you, have, you actually have to go to the 3D Ising model, to, uh, which has not been solved exactly. It's one of the most outstanding problems in theoretical physics, like an exact solution of the 3D Ising model. Uh, but if you look at the exponents uh, that you get from here, 0 0.627, I think that's, okay, they're probably much more precise now. Uh, this is data from, I got from a textbook, so I think people have been solving the system numerically uh, with 
better, better accuracy. I think you can see that uh, with these match the experimentally found values doing much better. So some of the 3D Ising model is a much better system uh, for a three-dimensional material, which of course we expect. Uh, but this has not been solved. So uh, although as I, I might conclude if I get time, uh, because it's a very active area of research, I might conclude with some recent developments uh, using the conformal bootstrap, which have managed to actually get much more information about the 3D Ising. It's a very active field of research um, at the moment. But, uh, but in these lectures, I'll be focusing on these. And in particular, we're going to get some understanding of how these numbers, say this one eighth, for instance, and uh, perhaps this, uh, this one quarter here and so on, how these numbers come out of conformal field theory. Okay, so what's the theory that can predict uh, these critical exponents? A continuum theory that can predict these critical exponents. Unfortunately, I've run out of time. Uh, I wanted to discuss also a little bit more the details of what these uh, correlation functions are, uh, but uh, I will we'll do that in the tutorial, and then in the tutorial we're also going to spend some time uh, figuring out how to minimize the free energy uh, for the 1D Ising model, the 2D Ising model, and seeing uh, the phase transitions or not that these systems have. So we're going to get uh, some new practice with uh, playing with this uh, free energy and this correlation. Okay. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, so you know, there's a tutorial tomorrow, I'm not sure which, which time, but one of the two tomorrows tomorrow afternoon is going to be on 